Uh, and uh, thank you once more to Science Europe for uh, this uh, insightful panel and for making this conference possible. Now, I'd, moving forward, I'd like to uh, introduce Marlene Fiaschi. Uh, she's the CEO of Science Business, and she will introduce our next uh, panel. Marilene, please. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so I don't need to introduce myself, myself I just did. So what we are going to do between now and lunch is to um, talk about innovation ecosystems. It's one of these buzzwords uh, in Brussels, buzzword travel. So what we are going to, to try to do is to understand what it means on the ground and look at the importance of linkages between the different types of organization. So I will call my fellow panelists uh, on the stage, and while we all come in, I'll introduce you. All right, so can you please come over? Sit wherever you want. Yeah, good. So I'll introduce first Jana. Jana Koller is the chair of S3 and the European Strategic Forum uh, for Research Infrastructures. Thank and you. Jana, thank you for joining us. Next to you, Andre Jajstik. Perfect. Yeah? Good, I practiced, <laughs> huh? uh, Vice President of the European Research Council. Thank you very much. You. I'll stick to Andrea huh, for the rest of the panel. I've done the efforts <laughs> with, okay. the, with the family name. <laughs> Next to you, Anu Norma. Uh, she's the Director General of the Estonian Research Council. And finally, Chris Annen, uh, Christian Annen, uh, Executive Government Relations uh, from G Aviation. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much <coughs> for, for joining us. Uh, we have an online audience as well, uh, in numbers, so uh, thank you again to you. Uh, I will take questions from the audience, so, and we will break several times, okay? So whenever you want to interact, just signal yourself. Same here on the, on the, on the stage. Innovation ecosystems. What is very good about this panel is really the mix of views we have, right? Research, ERC, uh, EU institutions industry, research, infrastructures. Everybody has a role to play, right? Locally, uh, regionally. So I'll just open by um, a simple question, and, um, and yeah, maybe, Andre, I'll start with you. We've heard several times that, um, that EU certain countries are lagging behind when it comes to uh, ERC applications, for instance. So why do you think uh, the ERC label, the grants, what do you think it matters in the region? What does it bring to the ecosystem? <laughs> you know, thank you, Marilyn, for your question. Uh, the point is, as, as you mentioned, that there is a low number of applications, first of all, from, say, EU-13 countries. So when we look at the numbers per year, we have between, from our region, between 400 to fa up to 500 applications. This constitutes only about 5% of total applications to ERC, which is on the order, say, of 8,500 yeah. uh, per year. So, so this is a simple fact. Uh, there is also a major problem with the quality of those applications of EU-13 countries. When we look at the assessment of applications at ERC, we know that the general success rate is very low. You know, it depends on money we have you know, from the European Commission. But anyway, when we look at proposals marked with C, so this means not acceptable, uh, in general it's around 30%. In step one, receives C. But when we look at applications from EU-13 countries, it's above 50%. Yeah. In, as performance and success in the step two is concerned, it's almost equal uh, between EU-13 and, and other countries. Yeah. But step one is a weak point. Simply, some of those applications are weak. Uh, and now, uh, a tough question of, say, uh, visibility of ERC grantees in the countries, uh, their impact, and so on. Mm, the situation is changing slowly, but first, when the first ERC grants were awarded to 
uh, I, I will use uh, example of my country, of Poland. Yeah, it's probably the, the safest way. So, when first year C grantees, uh, first year researchers from uh, for Poland received ERC grants, the reaction of the community, research community, was indifference mainly. So we don't care what what those guys are doing. You know, it's uh, then. There were examples of hostility from other researchers and administrations of institutions. Uh, you why? That, yeah. Why hostility? Uh, one was that jealousy. Yeah, simply, you know. And some researchers expected there could be would be more pressure on them to uh, to be in line with those ERC grantees. Yeah, to work more. As administration is concerned, there was a need to, to learn more about new schemes, about managing proposals uh, and, and grants, in fact. Uh, although the management of ERC grants is very simple, comparing to other, uh, say, EU programs. Uh, and so also are ex say, extra work. Are you work. saying that the, the organizations are not maybe ready to manage prestige? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So, so this was the first reaction. But the situation is slowly changing. Uh, some university rectors, for example, realize that it's good to have ERC grantees just for the visibility of the university. Uh, this is not. This does not necessarily mean that this is at every university, but at least at some. And we have also now some enclaves of, say, good research which is reflected in number of ERC grants. When you look, for example, at a group of computer science researchers at the University of Warsaw, they received more ERC grants than a similar group of computer science researchers at Oxford University, for example, or Weizmann Institute. Or so, so there are such in place that these are good seeds uh, for future. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let's move from Poland to Estonia. Mm -hmm. uh, Estonia is a small country uh, striving in many regards, right? And often taken as an example, actually. Can we say that Estonia can be considered a model in terms of innovation ecosystem? Um, uh, yes, I, I believe so. And uh, there are many, very many aspects uh, that uh, need to be taken into account if you talk about the model, because uh, as we already have discussed yesterday and today also, the even in this EU 13 countries, we are very different in some way. So we, we act differently. And uh, just to go a little bit back from in the history, not too far, but uh, I re remember you 2017 when Estonia was um, uh, had EU presidency and there was a call for action to increase uh, the political commitment in the research and the development investments, but also increase trust to the research system. And there was also a call that uh, countries could raise their uh, uh, input to the research and development to free percentage. So public part could be one percentage of GDP and uh, private uh, but uh, part uh, two percentage, and Estonia really did it. So that it uh, managed to get the one percent yeah. and the two percent. Yeah, from two, two years ago there was a political agreement. All parties agreed, almost all, that uh, this is something where we want to develop, and and we will do it. So two years ago it was political decision that one percentage of public funding will go to the research and development. So we are now seeing really increase in, uh, in, in is investment. And actually last year it also happens that part from the private sector was bigger than uh, part from the governmental sector. So, so we slowly develop in this direction what was politically agreed. And another very important uh, issue in this uh, political uh, decision was that uh, in our new strategy, what is about research, development, innovation, and entrepreneurship, we, had, we have three pillars. First, it is very proper research system. It includes also infrastructure, but we also have the uh, 
transfer of knowledge is from research to entrepreneurship. We have there several measures planned, including intersectoral mobility, and then the third pillar is uh, environment for the enterprises, but supports the research, uh, high level of research in their products and services. So this is a strategy that we are now uh, uh, keeping in mind and also that we fina finance uh, in synergies from our local national funds, from European structural funds, and of course, including also European programs. But I guess it's an important message of all this is really that uh, Estonia is so small that we, starting from 1990, we really didn't have an option to create own small Estonian bubble somewhere in the far, far away. But uh, we, we had to take account that if we don't collaborate, if we don't move to towards membership in EU, if we don't move in the membership of NATO, OSD, other international organizations, we, we can't uh, achieve the life that we want to our own people and we can't uh, be part of the solutions in the global level because we face now really the big challenges as a humankind, not uh, every small country. And just one follow-up question and then uh, because you raised the question of private investment, maybe I'll come to you, uh, Chris, afterwards. Uh, just so you've, you've mentioned that, uh, that this 1% GDP uh, public investment is, was also meant to attract more private uh, capital, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. private investment. Uh, was it, did, did this investment come from local companies or has it, uh, were, were there um, companies from abroad coming and investing in Estonia further to that target, to that objective? Uh, currently we really see uh, both uh, <laughs> directions so that actually if you if you count uh, like Estonian uh, startup companies, uh, we are the first almost in Europe per uh, per person. If we have uh, uh, most of the uni uh, unicorns uh, per persons. We have invested uh, like uh, per persons uh, like among first uh, in Europe, but. Uh, it really means that we have very low number of people, so that the percentage alone doesn't really work. So it also okay. means that how big is the uh, absolute number. And uh, there we very really see that we, we need both. We need more uh, talented people, or actually we need uh, more people in general. Everyone is very valuable. So we, we put a lot of... Uh, effort to our education system, to also to support the innovation uh, uh, ecosystem, to, to support the mindset of uh, entrepreneurship in our young people, uh, but also we really uh, have to do actions to uh, attract foreign investments, and these are both on the table of political decisions right now. Okay, good. Maybe Chris, I'll come to you. It's a, it's a natural segue uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, private uh, or corporate investment. Gen uh, GE Aviation, so you probably have to, uh, to resume the, uh, the explanation of the, uh, what the company is doing in the, in the region, but more specifically, uh, you have operations here in Czech Republic, mm -hmm. right? And yep. in other countries. So why? Why has an American company or a company headquartered in the US decided to invest here in the region? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Marilyn. Again, thanks for the invitation and for having me. Uh, huge pleasure. Always nice to be back in Czech Republic. So, a um, couple of reasons. Do I need to explain who we are, what we do? One well, minute. I know. Maybe you know. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, so we're the global market leader in aircraft propulsion, uh, both commercial and military. So, if you flew in on a A320 or 737, uh, probably our engines. Uh, we also service most of the air forces around the world, uh, very short. Um, global company, 45,000 people, of which 12,000 in Europe. We have 500 here in the Czech Republic, 2,500 in Poland, about 300 in Hungary, and 100 plus, I guess, in Romania. Um, back to your question on the why do we invest here. Yeah. Um, I would say three main reasons for investments in a certain area. In random order, it's proximity to customers. 
So um, where are the airframers, the Airbus, the Boeing, and the airlines? Second reason is, uh, but maybe less important, is the availability of government support. We can talk a bit about that later. And third, most importantly, is the availability of talent, obviously. So without the people, you won't be able to turn a single screw. Um, I need to go back to 2007 to kind of explain why we are here. So there was a company here in the Czech Republic called Walter Engines that had certain capabilities that we did not have. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a specific kind of engine, it's called a turboprop. Uh, so it's with a propeller, basically. We did not have them, and our main competitor does. They're the global market leader. We had an interest in that. This, this company in Czech Republic was a legacy company, very old, very established, and uh, it was a huge opportunity for us to, to, to pick it up and to include it in the GE family. Uh, so we added capabilities locally in Europe, which was part of the strategy to increase our presence in, um, in, uh, in Europe. 2007, we move forward to 2017. Uh, we got a request from a very important uh, airframer to develop a, an entirely new engine, a new turboprop. We had this company in Czech Republic. We started to talk to Czech Invest, I think they're also present here, yeah. and to, uh, to some entities in Poland, NCBR and PIS. What can we do? We have this substantial investment and we want to do it here. What else can we do? We got introduced to um, uh, CBUT, the Technical University in Prague, and to VZLU, which is the research institute, and we teamed up, and since then we have a collaborative agreement to develop and test and certify the engine here in Europe. And a lot of the work is being done in the Czech Republic. So again, it's the availability of talent, but it's also the ecosystem, which is one of the main topics of this session that made us decide that we're here. If I may expand the question a bit, because there is also a nice future outlook and there's a, there is a logical consequence to it. So from the legacy technologies, we moved to this new clean sheet engine. Mm -hmm. 2017, it has been tested in flight last June, ready to be certified. The next step is the participation from our Czech entity, G Aviation Czech, with VZLU, with CBUT in clean aviation which is the new public-private partnership uh, funded by the European Commission. And we envision a flying test bed in 2027 with the same engine, but hybridized. So it will be hybrid electric. So we're already looking at the future, uh, making aviation more sustainable, uh, again, with an engine made in the Czech Republic. So if you look at the timeline, we go from 2007, 17, 27, it's a 20 year time frame, but we're getting there very slowly and working with the ecosystem here. A sidestep, and then I will stop talking, is that this very same engine has also been selected for the Eurodrone, which is a military application. So you can also diversify from technologies with that same core technology. So with investment after investment, you see also the ecosystem growing and stepping up to, uh, to the opportunity here. Well, thank you. You've also yeah. closed the loop with the European programs and with the public-private partnerships at the EU level. So that that's uh, a way also to, to be inclusive, uh, right, about the, yeah. uh, the, the local entities uh, of the aviation. So thank you for doing that. We'll come back to some of the points, Jana. Uh, research infrastructures. We've heard a lot already about research infrastructures since we started the discussion yesterday. Eli is um, uh, cited as, uh, as example. Uh, but what's the, um, so we're talking about attracting talents here. So how does do, do research infrastructures um, play a role in, uh, at, uh, in, the, in that respect? Well, um, research infrastructures tick most of the boxes mm -hmm. that attract, uh, why uh, um, that attract uh, uh, excellent researchers or let's say good researchers or researchers in general. Now, we have uh, heard from several speakers so far uh, what are the motivations. Also, Matsei mentioned and uh, the uh, commissioner earlier, uh, fundamentally, more than the salaries, although they also matter. Uh, we, it's difficult for Eastern Europe to compete uh, when it comes to salaries, although that can also be done. But the main motivation is the academic motivations. Researchers want to do research that they're interested in, that's highly excel uh, that is excellent, 
um, in, uh, that will contribute to their careers. For this, they need, first of all, the opportunity, access to a network, uh, preferably also a good, uh, well-known academic institution. Unfortunately, this works against Central uh, and Eastern Europe in, uh, to a certain extent, because even, uh, even if some centers are excellent, they're not visible enough. So this part is something that is difficult to establish in Eastern Europe, even if research is excellent. And then we also need, in addition to these academic motivations, the, the policy needs to do its job by uh, uh, enabling academic freedom, freedom of research, so that the researcher that comes is able to really pursue its academic interests. Um, now, can I just actually interrupt yes. you? It's it's uh, it's not the first time we hear about the academic of freedom, yep. uh, the freedom of uh, yeah, the academic freedom, the acad the the freedom of research. Uh, is there more freedom of research in Central and Eastern Europe than elsewhere in Europe? Uh, no, I I would say that uh, freedom of research is heavily linked, uh, basically to uh, how you. Uh, uh, the academic, uh, the uh, culture, the research culture that you have in a country, and uh, typically for Central and Eastern countries, it works against us because we come from. <coughs> I come from Slovenia, so we come from decades of systems which worked differently, and uh, this is actually widely acknowledged. And this is something that policy has to work on mm -hmm. to make this uh, more attractive and also well known across Europe that we're working on this and that there are opportunities. Um, so um, coming to research infrastructures, we've heard that center, so if you want as policymaker to uh, make your country more attractive and attract researchers, uh, one possibility is uh, you invest more, you need to do that anyhow, we heard that also from uh, Anu. Now, uh, one thing is to make all country brighter, equally brighter or, which is more likely to succeed, you focus on some centers of excellence, which where you focus uh, a lot of funding in certain areas where you have some excellence, and then count on the spillover effects that will raise the rest of the country, that will affect uh, the rest of the country. Now, uh, research infrastructures are such centers of excellence. Especially, for example, the brightest one, literally the brightest, is uh, the one that we have here uh, that was mentioned earlier, uh, the laser infrastructure, ELI, uh, ex uh, Extreme Light Source, uh, which is located, which has been built up uh, in Hungary and uh, Czech Republic and has just started with operations. Now, the reason why this ticks the boxes is, first of all, it's uh, the best laser facility in the world. It is highly internationalized already, so uh, it attracts, it's evident that it attracts uh, the uh, talents from across the globe. Uh, the country also here in Czech Republic worked on uh, the salaries part, which are in this case increased. And we also heard from Lukas uh, in the earlier session that they are also focusing on the research culture, mm -hmm. which is an extremely important part. But let me add to this that it's not just this uh, large single-sided <coughs> facilities. Now what I'll be talking today mainly when it comes to mobility is the facilities that offer, ex research infrastructures that offer access to the facility rather than uh, virtual infrastructures. So uh, the several of the S3 research infrastructures are distributed among several countries. And you have notes in uh, also several uh, Eastern European countries, which are uh, a part of this uh, S3 pan-European research infrastructures. And uh, there's uh, a significant contribution to the mobility that we are discussing now <coughs> and to the excellence through these networks of excellent hubs, which are as a priority funded also on national level because they are prioritized as part of the S3, their national contribution to S3 research infrastructures. Uh, these S3 research infrastructures have, because a lot of them are organized as ERIC, so they have legal entity, uh, they have uh, joint policies which are then applied through, the, uh, through their nodes. They uh, structure the community 
and uh, facilitate mobility among the nodes. And also by bringing researchers to the facilities to use, they increase their visibility and enable to integrate the also the Eastern European excellence into this uh, European networks. So the I would just like to point out that uh, research infrastructures, <coughs> while they tick most of the boxes, the big, very, very large facilities such as Eli, also the distributed ones significantly contribute to this uh, 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 attractiveness on the national level. Okay, I want to come back to the question of visibility. Okay, uh, visibility of uh, of local, of regional uh, research and, uh, and innovation organization uh, organizations. So there is is. Uh, do you think there is a lack of recognition of uh, of regional? I mean, there is no lack of centers of excellence here uh, or or uh, excellent universities mm -hmm. and centers of uh, of research. So what is missing to make them more visible abroad at the international level? Is there is there a lack of recognition? Should they do a better job uh, to promote themselves? Yeah. Oh, I, I can say that we have to remember that, for example, in Central Europe, there are some old universities. For example, the first university in Central Europe is Charles University in Prague, that, was, uh, that is older than any university in today's Germany, for example. Uh, the second one in Central Europe was a Gilonian University created in, in 1364 in Krakow, Poland. So there has been a very long tradition. Uh, so some of those institutions are visible, uh, but th there are various problems. Uh, and I, I would like to return to your question about uh, freedom of research. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are, say, two counteractive driving forces. One is just to, to drive to complete freedom in research. Uh, that is, in fact, advocated by ERC, yeah? which uh, gives a chance to break through to some new, completely new ideas. Uh, and the other is just to set priorities to focus on the, some topics and some claim that this is, say, uh, a more efficient way to spending money for research. And when I compare, for example, Poland and, and, and some universities in Western Europe, uh, I think that we have more freedom. That is that researchers are allowed to do whatever they want. But this could also mean that some of them are working on absolutely obsolete topics, <laughs> outdated and so on. Yeah? So this is the other side yeah, of the freedom. Yeah? So it's a very complex issue. Yeah? So, and the visibility, you know, it's, uh, some, some universities in my country are pretty big in terms of number of students and mm -hmm. researchers. And uh, I mentioned the University of Warsaw, a group of, of computer uh, science researchers, a very strong group with good contacts around Europe, and there are some uh, research centers or research groups uh, in Poland, for example, in molecular biology and so on, that have, that have very good visibility. They are, say, integrated in, say, international research. Uh, but uh, lots of, of researchers in my country, uh, they are sometimes called at institutions dead wood, yeah, so they are employed, they do something, <laughs> but their results are, yeah, very mediocre, so, so this is the problem. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. anyone wants to come in on the question of visibility? Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I may add uh, one more word, actually, but I haven't heard very much during the, uh, the day here, and it was something that I started to think during uh, commissioner talk, uh, in in the morning session and uh, and it is not only like uh, visibility or or access to the funding and infrastructure but uh, but we I really have a personal experience here to share as well but this is really the inspiration so that uh, talented people would like to make the work what really creates chains, so what is inspiring for them, and especially for the young generations, 
say they would like to add something to the big challenges to solve and, and find solutions together. And uh, going back uh, almost the same time, as you mentioned, in 2008, as a small country as Estonia, we hardly joined EU. We started to look new collaboration schemes in European Space Agency. And we often co uh, heard that uh, you are so small, what do you do here to go work? in the field and not in space. But actually, it was, it was really inspiring for the big number of young, talented people over the globe. So we got students from uh, Germany, from uh, America, from uh, Latvia. So we actually had 14 different countries participating in our first uh, satellite project that mm -hmm. was launched in 2014. And it really happened like this, that uh, in 2018, we also got the funding from the European Commission. It was called RECPOT at that time. And uh, it was the first European project in, in my institute. No one believed that we can get any funding from Europe because it is so difficult, so high uh, excellence level. But we got this million euros. And it was really a huge uh, influence to the story where Estonia is uh, today being a very digital country, being a member of European Space Agency, but also in Europe, we, we have today European Union space program and flagships like uh, Copernicus, Galileo, they provide uh, security for Europe during this very difficult uh, period that, uh, that we have now here in the frame of uh, security. So you never know what could uh, kick off such kind of big change in your country, but uh, inspiration for the young generation, I guess this is really the key figure how we attract young generation in Europe, because we don't have the brain drain only in the EU 13 countries. Very talented young people, actually, it was mentioned earlier, they also would like to go to US, to Japan, to everywhere. So mm -hmm. we have to work together in Europe to have these talented people here working for our system and for our future. All right. Jana. Yes. So uh, research infrastructures from uh, uh, the physical facilities, a uh, pan-European one, uh, uh, significantly contribute to mobility around Europe because it brings uh, researchers to the uh, infrastructure wherever it is located in Europe. So basically they apply, they are evaluated, and they're, then they're brought to the facilities to do research. Uh, significant amounts of mid-scale research infrastructures have been funded with structural funds in Eastern and Central Europe. And several of these, for example, if we take CETEC in Brno, several of these are integrated strongly into European research infrastructures. And through this, uh, European researchers come to do research at, for example, CETEC, getting to know the instrumentation, but also the quality of the support that they receive there. And the result that we observe now with these distributed research infrastructures is that uh, these centers are much better integrated in European programs because the users like the support the knowledge which is there uh, and the infrastructure which they need, otherwise they wouldn't apply for it, and they bring them into European projects. Uh, so this is now seen really as an impact, although uh, these distributed research infrastructures are, uh, let's say, a recent thing, more or less a recent thing, so we are still, they're still growing. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, quite an important contribution. All right, uh, Chris, maybe, uh, and there is a question for you, so you can read it uh, while I ask a question uh, to Chris. Uh, you mentioned, Chris, the, um, uh, you the, the Czech entity uh, of the aviation being involved in a clean aviation uh, project. So why does it matter uh, for the aviation to have different units um, involved in projects, either under the collaborative uh, research in, uh, in Horizon, uh, under uh, a public-private partnership, or I think you're also involved in, uh, in the European Defence Fund, yes right? Yes, we are, yeah. So why how does it help to have these this entities directly involved, and does it help giving them more visibility and ultimately attracting talent? Mm, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so being a US-headquartered company, we 
sometimes we need to be a bit of a chameleon. So especially when it comes to the European Defense Fund, <coughs> we can only work with European entities, by definition, yeah. with a state guarantee. Uh, being the Polish government, Czech government or Italian government saying that mm -hmm. whatever we develop is protected for European interest. Um, less strict, but I think politically equally important for clean aviation is that and, and the rules of Horizon Europe and Horizon 2020 before that stipulate that is that you need to um, uh, monetize or you need to exploit the IP that you have in Europe if you want to do the funding. Um, so it's, there are very simple reasons to do that, but more importantly is that um, being a global business, it makes no sense to do everything in the US. So we want to have a full OEM, so original equipment manufacturer capacity in Europe. So those, that's a very simple reason to, uh, to do it here. Uh, it's, it's leveraging as much capabilities as possible, de-risking your investment. Just to give you an example, a relatively simple engine will cost you half a billion and 10 years to develop something more complex that goes on a wide body, mm -hmm. two billion maybe, 15 years, and, and you don't know whether it will sell or not. So, it, so it's very risky. So kind of using as many locations as possible just, just makes, makes total sense. Yeah. All right. Uh, there are questions for you. Jana, I read them out. Um, so we have, well, we have two questions for you, actually, and one for Anu. Uh, so uh, Horizon Europe includes today calls focused on uh, innovation ecosystems. How S3 could link up uh, with future innovation valleys to advance their development? Should it also consider smart specialization approaches to reinforce the efficiency of those systems? Um, of the uh, innovation valleys. Uh, well, uh, first of all, innovation valleys are place-based initiatives, so smart specialization yeah. certainly makes, uh, is very important for the ones that are uh, basically now the uh, cohesion policy is linked to uh, uh, smart specialization. You want to use the funds, it was not in the previous program, but now it is. You want to use uh, uh, structural funds which are particularly well suited actually for the innovation value, to support innovation values. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. Also, smart specialization means that the country, the region looked into its strengths and decided its investments in a particular topic. Hopefully it will be the one of the innovation values. So, um, so it's important to link the two. Now, uh, when it comes to the research infrastructure, also the innovation agenda uh, uh, mentions the uh, need for uh, research infrastructures and their relevant role in the implementation uh, because they are a very important part of the ecosystem. Uh, you will see the, uh, well, research infrastructures uh, reasonably strongly connected with various industries, for example, also if we take in the uh, case of very large research infrastructures and the recent COVID crisis, uh, particularly synchrotrons, for example, were strongly uh, supporting the uh, developments towards the, um, let's say, the uh, solutions uh, to COVID crisis. And they were used by the industry to uh, deliver the solutions. So it is very clear that research infrastructures are need to be strongly integrated into the uh, innovation policy. Uh, there is one more question for you that I read out, and if there are questions in the room, uh, now is the time. Uh, so just one more for you. Uh, could you mention an example of joint policies in the topic of talent attraction around across the EU? Do you have anything in mind? Uh, joint policies uh, in what? Uh, can you? In talent attraction. On, the, on talent attraction? Uh, within research infrastructures, for example. I believe so, because the question is... Well, yes. Uh, well, research... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, I would like to hear more about that question, because research infrastructure uh, are based to... Uh, the core uh, business is to attract talent to do research. Uh, so it's the core business uh, of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have uh, policies linked to this, um, mainly several uh, of them. Sorry, several of several them. of them <laughs> because it's the core business. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do we have questions here in the room? 
Okay, we keep going, keep thinking, they will come. Uh, about the talent pipeline, I want to ask you about... Uh, so, Chris, you mentioned that DE came to, to the region also for the, the availability of talents. Yeah. Do you have all the talents you need? No. Ah. No. So, <laughs> so a couple of things are happening. Um, I mentioned before that we are now moving in the space of more sustainable aviation. So you're looking at electrification, hybridization, using sustainable fuels, using liquid hydrogen as a fuel. So the, the talent set is changing. So 20 years ago it was, and I'm exaggerating here, turbo machinery. So thermodynamics, aerodynamics, mechanics. Now we need uh, electronics, power electronics, material science becoming more important, carbon matrix composites, 3D printing, alloys, so the, the skill set is changing uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we need those new talents next to the existing skill set because an engine runs for about 20 years on average. So it's, it comes on top of that. So that's one thing. The second thing is that as we need different skill sets, we are beginning to compete with different companies. In the past, it was, it was us, Pratt & Whitney, Rolls, Safran, and that was it. Now we compete with all tech companies because everybody's pooling power electronics people, material science. So the pool of competitors has become larger. And the third element I would be keen to hear uh, from you as well is that post pandemic, we see um, different needs from the population, from the working population. I mean, being a rather conservative industry, we're used to work in you know, project teams, lock ourselves in meeting rooms, work with deadlines and deliverables and all of that. And many young people, they're just not into that anymore. And they want more flexibility. Um, so we need to rethink the way we work. We need to rethink office space. We need different tools. We need different IT tools. But we also um, compete very differently on the job market. Because someone could have a career with us in Warsaw at the Engineering Design Center, get a call from a company in the UK, offer him a job while staying on Warsaw because he can work remotely more easily for a different company. So there is an entirely new dimension. I think in general the, the pool of talent is large enough, but the, the, the competition space has, has enlarged considerably. Do you have an idea of how many people you're lacking? How, m how many recruitment? So for, for the coming decade yeah. I can see how many we need. It, it's in the hundreds in hundreds. Europe. Hundreds. Yeah. Across Europe. Across Europe. Yeah. All right. Then I think the 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 next question is how do we uh, where should we start that recruitment? How to build the pipeline and at what level does the pipeline need to be triggered to get those talents that large companies need and not only large companies, universities as well in, in research mm -hmm. obviously. And yeah. Yes, maybe one first thought what I got in my mind is really what about earlier was discussed about um, how research careers should be uh, uh, revised so that we actually appreciate uh, this uh, way that a young researcher is working uh, part of uh, his her career in, in the industry and it is really valued so it is not because uh, he gets uh, more money, but he gets a really different type of skills. He gets really better understanding what does uh, <coughs> needs by the society, and really also that how turn on a uh, next level of uh, of studies or or uh, knowledge gathering uh, towards better career in the future. So that uh, this is something what we in Estonia have. Uh, uh, created as uh, sectoral mobility uh, measures, so it is really appreciated that uh, young researcher or older researcher in any any age, uh, you spend some time in in public sector, in industry, but also that there should be way back to the academical level and and in such a way have this life learning uh, process, so that uh, that it 
it helps in the academic freedom so that you really can do research, but uh, but your career is appreciated, not depending in which uh, sector you you spend some time. So I guess that this could be one uh, one way out of this talent uh, pool okay. to have more people engaged. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, uh, when you are s uh, telling us about the problems of attracting people to just work in in a single place and to uh, to be present in person. Uh, uh, there was such a problem, I, I still remember as a very young person, that, but involved in telecommunication standardization because my area is telecommunications. So it was 40, 50 years ago, there was a problem how to get good people to prepare telecommunication standards. Because it, it used to be, it still is, extremely important and the work was, uh, it, it requires good brains and it's absolutely boring yeah, in terms of the work that is done over those standards. So, and of course, uh, those times there, there was no uh, remote working and so on. So the way to attract talents was just to organize meetings, in-person meetings, in very attractive places in the world. Hawaii, Tahiti, you know. And they were doing that boring work five days per week, so for, for a month, for example, and uh, but spending free time in really nice places with good food and you know, drinks and so on. So maybe <laughs> this is the way out. <laughs> yeah, no, and, but we also have questions from the audience, so we, we need a microphone, please. Uh, yeah, if you can bring a microphone, Lenisa. I think we have Lydia, Miklos and Monika. So we'll take all at once, but go ahead, yes. Yana. Uh, well, researchers are highly mobile, also because the uh, jobs the, the job that they have are usually very precarious, because there are not enough of the stable jobs to do research. Uh, but uh, the fact is that they need to be stimulated for the intersectoral mobility, for example, to move to the private sector and back. Now, this uh, 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 should be done by uh, through the policy to incentivize them, and it's a very important part of the new era which was launched this year, that the agreement on the reform of research uh, assessment has been reached by several stakeholders and uh, is now being implemented. Now, the, uh, this agreement also considers a wide variety of uh, research outputs, including cooperation with academia, but also the mobility uh, intersectoral mobility, and this is something that I think will strongly contribute to closer integration and cooperation between the two sectors. All right, Lydia, yes. let's we we'll take them all at once. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Lydia Borrell from Science Europe. Um, just a, 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 s a spontaneous comment and reaction to Jana. I fully agree. I think the research, uh, uh, as the initiative for research assessment that we are starting, can be an element of of cohesion. Uh, around Europe. Um, my question was more for Anu and maybe as a matter of reflection for all. Um, we have put or we tend to put Estonia as, a, as an example, as a very good example, um, but I think that in, in addition to all the factors that you have mentioned uh, that play, I think that uh, Estonia has been also very good in communicating science to their citizens. This is something that has not emerged mm. in this dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, my point of reflection with you, with uh, uh, Arno, is to what extent do you think that has contributed to your success? And couldn't this be also an inspiration for others to connect better with the citizens? Uh, Hold your thought. Miklos. Thank you. Actually, three questions to Christian. <laughs> Well, we don't have much time left. <laughs> <laughs> well, short. Uh, some decades ago, there was a saying that 40% of uh, the tasks given to recent graduates of masters, uh, which were employed in multinationals, have to be retraining. What is the retraining after they got the master's degree? What is the situation today? Secondly, some five, year, five years ago, science business organized a workshop in Brussels in which uh, a chief executive of, of Hewlett Packard said that they only employ level of PhDs. What is your policy today? Because being a PhD you have to be you have to have research training. 
and the third issue, what is the, your policy in mobility between industry and academia? Hmm. How do you look at this? Final one. Thank you. I'm Monica Dietl from Initiative for Science in Europe. I have a question also for Christian, but for the others, which is in the, in the line of the first questions, is um, you say you need new people with new skills. How far do you think the universities in Europe or as well out abroad are aware of this and change their uh, training uh, programs to adapt to new needs? And how far do you talk to universities to make to uh, attract attention on this uh, difficulty we are confronted to? Because this is in your field, but we observe this in many, many, if not in all fields. We take the, the, the questions in reverse order. So Chris, you start, mm -hmm. and then Anna. Yeah. So I will, I will do my best to answer your questions. I Please may not go ahead. have a very clear answer. So maybe we start with uh, with the universities. So we have. In Europe, an, an ecosystem, it's called ETEC. Um, it's coordinated by Avio Aero in Italy, but it includes also universities here in the region and uh, research institutes. I think it's from the top of my head, 30 universities in total with whom we collaborate. Uh, so we, we create our own ecosystem around our research and development um, uh, efforts. Um, we do engage. Uh, both with universities as well as with uh, with ministries about this challenge, but it is it's a very slow moving machinery, if you will, uh, because in my personal opinion, uh, I have three children. Uh, it starts already at elementary school and and high school. You know, I sometimes feel we still focus on. I'm not saying the wrong things, but I think we need to re-emphasize new skills as well. So it already starts there. Um, I also fully realize that as a university, you cannot change your faculty system overnight. It's, it's, it's just not possible. You need to, it, it takes investments, you need to build curricula, you need to attract professors and, and teachers and what have you ever. So, but the, the, sig the signals all are out there and we try to, uh, to move the needle. I hope that answers your question. I'm a bit less sure about, about your questions, if I can, can answer them. Um, so. We, we do have plenty of PhDs. Traditionally, we had our global research center in upstate New York. We still have it. I think in its heyday, it had more than 2,000 PhDs. So really, really low TRL work. We used to have a global research center in Munich. And usually, the way we work is that we are um, embedded with either a research institute or university on campus. So like in Munich, we are you know, uh, very close to the TUN. In Warsaw, we are very close to uh, Lukashevich's Institute. It's, it's almost symbiotic. Mm -hmm. So uh, they kind of uh, keep the mm -hmm. pipeline uh, alive. Um, attracting PhDs and, and so to allow people to do their PhD at us, that's a resource challenge because it requires people from our side to kind of uh, you know, work with, uh, with a candidate to do that. We do it, but uh, uh, we need to prioritize things as much as possible. All right. Yeah. Anu, yeah, there is a question for you. Yeah. Thank you, Lydia, for pointing out the science communication part. It is really true that we, we have the dedicated program in Estonia, but uh, actually, I guess that it is part of our culture. It has been there for a very, very long time. So probably because Estonia is rather small, everyone knows everybody. So <laughs> it's almost like a normal. As a researcher, you, you do... Uh, some uh, outreach activities, you, you work with children or present your results. So it, it really has been part of the culture and now it is really supported also in the governmental program. And I am very happy to see that this uh, behavior is now the also taking over in our uh, innovation ecosystem so that uh, many of our startup companies they work uh, very closely as a community and uh, and they are very big uh, patriot patriots in their uh, domain so they do a lot of uh, voluntary work or and they also organize um, different 
develop uh, new actions directed to the science communications. For example, there is a very uh, powerful IT company and uh, they started a specific school for girls in IT, it is called Unicorn Squared. So they, they really do things like, uh, like science communications and it uh, it seems as uh, it's a culture, and we are of course happy to share this experience with European community if there is more interest. And and as Lydia knows, the uh, Estonian our research council is now leading the Science Europe communication activity. So that uh, yeah, we hope that this culture will be distributed everywhere. All right. Well, thank you very much. Are the 15 seconds final comment from from, from you? Otherwise, we will wrap. Yeah. Here. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, very science communication, we are time. losing ground in Europe. In a typical daily newspaper in Poland, for example, uh, I'm talking about mainstream, yeah. uh, not tabloids, uh, there's practically nothing about research or science or research results, about a moving uh, second league soccer player from one team to other team with half a page. Yeah? But when I read... Uh, English editions of, of newspapers, daily newspapers published in China, either main, mainland or in Taiwan, uh, there is a considerable percentage of the contents is devoted to research achievements, to, to what happened in, in research locally or worldwide. Mm -hmm. yeah, so All we right. have to work on it. <laughs> Jana, you have the final one. Uh, yes, uh, a, a lot had been said about uh, widening, attracting people to this uh, Central European regions. I think that uh, in European level, it's not one program, uh, as was mentioned also, but Maria, uh, it's 3% for the widening that can solve the situation in Europe. We all need to work on it at every level, regional, national and European, and all the initiatives should actually be considering also European level uh, initiatives, should be considering what they should do to contribute to the uh, attraction uh, and mobility of talent across Europe. Very good. This is a very good way to, to end this discussion. So I'd like to join me in thanking the four <laughs> panelists.